the fifth kind. The Stegnographia concerned the art of concealing hidden messages within written texts, a discipline with an immediate application in the world of espionage. The book also proposed methods for remote communication and remote viewing. I've become convinced of remote viewing because I've experienced it myself. I've seen others do it. I've seen children do it. I think it's even more compelling to note that the intelligence agencies of major world powers over a period of more than three decades have invested millions and millions of dollars into programs of remote viewing. It serves government for the public to believe that remote viewing is something that's been debunked or discredited while secretly practicing it in private. One set of information about remote viewing for the public and another for the powers. And this parallel track of information about remote viewing, you can find iterations of that all through the ages and a very interesting parallel in the foundations of British intelligence 400 years ago. If you can picture the relationship between the mythical King Arthur and his Merlin, that's the relationship between Queen Elizabeth I and John Dee. Queen Elizabeth preferred him to use his handle, which was 007. John Dee needed a practitioner, and so he hired a man by the name of Edward Kelly. What they were aiming at was contact with entities they described as angels. The word angels doesn't indicate a particular genus or biology. It simply says that we're dealing with an entity that is not human, that has more advanced abilities in terms of travel, and is here on a mission, on an assignment, or with a message. I would argue that most of our angel stories are in fact stories of paleo contact, our ancestors' memories of contact with extraterrestrials. Check out our official website at fifthkind.tv. From 1972 to 1995, US intelligence maintained programs of remote viewing. Under the guidance of Stanford Research Institute, the agencies involved included the Defense Intelligence Agency, the National Security Agency, the Drug Enforcement Agency, and the Joint Chiefs of Staff, all under the aegis of the CIA. The reason that US intelligence became involved in remote viewing was that they discovered that the USSR had a program already up and running. Now, the Soviet Union operated within a paradigm that was very strictly atheistic and materialistic. There was no room for spirituality, religion, supernatural. And so US intelligence knew that if Russia had this program going, it must be because it was yielding useful data, scientifically verifiable data, data that might give them a strategic advantage. And in the climate of the Cold War at that time, there was no way that the USA was going to allow the Soviet Union to have a strategic advantage over anything. And so if the Russians had a program of remote viewing, then the USA had to have one. And all of a sudden, US intelligence was in a game of remote viewing catch up. Of course, all governments want to spy on their allies and enemies, and no government wants to be spied on. And so US intelligence began to fund a series of remote viewing programs under various names, including Project Stargate and the Scanning Initiative. Before long, some notable outcomes had been achieved. On April 28, 1973, Ingo Swan, a remote viewer in the program, performed a remote viewing of the planet Jupiter. He described and sketched rings around the planet, which no astronomer had ever seen or even postulated. Nine months later, the NASA probe Voyager arrived at Jupiter and successfully filmed the enormous rings orbiting the huge planet. The rings were exactly as Ingo Swan had reported from his remote viewing, 
nine months before the photographs arrived. I was involved recently in an experiment in which we were working with young kids to heighten their visual sensitivity. And so each child would wear a blindfold that totally blocked out the light, but enabled them to open their eyes and look into the darkness. Now I was with a particular child who were called Jason, and at the beginning of the exercise, he could see absolutely nothing with this blindfold on. And then after working with the trainer for a few minutes, he was able to call the colors of cards being flashed in front of his face. So I'm watching this and thinking, okay, well maybe there's enough of a leakage of light somehow, at some microscopic level, that means he can discern the colors. But then the cards were flashed behind his head and Jason could still call the names of the colors as they were changed. And then the trainer put colors back to back and Jason could call the order of the colors. So this was now stretching my ability to explain what was happening. This had gone beyond heightening the sensitivity of the eyes. It had gone beyond color receptors on the face. This was now behind Jason's head. And I'm thinking, well, is this something to do with the electromagnetic field of each candidate, somehow tuning into the wider EMF? And then it went to the next level. Now, Jason was reading from a book he'd never read before and reading fluently, bearing in mind he could see absolutely nothing at the beginning of the experiment. Then color here, then color here. Now he's reading words off a page. Then the trainer did something that took it to a whole other level. Out of the blue, he suddenly said, Jason, what am I holding underneath my desk? And Jason said, oh, I can see two circles of glass um, there's black wire around them, and then I can see two sticks of black metal or black wire. And the trainer pulls out from under his desk a pair of black wire-framed spectacles with big round lenses. Now, there was no way Jason had seen that because that desk was off camera in another country. The trainer was in Canada. We were in Australia. So now I'm thinking, okay, this isn't just about heightening visual skills. We're doing remote viewing here. This cannot be heightening receptors on the face or in the eye. This has to be something to do with the nature of space itself and the nature of human consciousness. And that small experiment really echoed the implications of Ingo Swann's viewing in April 1973, because to remote view something at a distance of half a billion miles goes well beyond having good eyesight. It has to do with the nature of time and space and human consciousness and how all those things interact. In 1974, the heiress Patty Hearst was kidnapped from her Berkeley apartment. Remote viewer Pat Price was able to identify the location of the car in which she'd been taken. Pat then went on to describe the layout of the apartment in which Patty Hurst was held and the closet in which she was confined. In 1975, a Russian bomber crashed in the African country of Zaire. Naturally, US defense was anxious to retrieve the down jet before the Russians could get to it. The problem was that for all their technology, US defense simply couldn't locate it. President Jimmy Carter later described what happened next. He said, we were not able to find it by surveillance. So the director of the CIA heard about a woman in California who was a medium or something. I don't know the title for her. And she gave him the latitude and longitude of the plane's whereabouts. And we located the plane where she said it was. Incidentally, the woman in question was not just a medium, she was an officer of the US Air Force. I think what's very interesting here is the separation of information. That's because President Jimmy Carter was and is a devout evangelical Christian believer. If the average evangelical Christian had said they were involved in something like remote viewing, they would be told within their church either that it was nonsense 
or that it was demonic. And in some churches, that might get them thrown out, might get them excommunicated. However, for an evangelical in power, it's another set of information. An evangelical president knows this is a useful human technology that can yield significant information and that it's perfectly legitimate for his department to engage in. One set of information about remote viewing for the public and another for the powers. Now this makes perfect sense because no government wants a general public that can remote view documents on a minister's desk. It serves government for the public to believe that remote viewing is something that's been debunked or discredited while secretly practicing it in private. And this parallel track of information about remote viewing, where you can find iterations of that all through the ages, and a very interesting parallel in the foundations of British intelligence 400 years ago. The funding for the CIA's remote viewing operations continued and was maintained by a succession of presidential administrations. Now the remote viewing program, like any program, had to justify its funding from year to year. And the only way it could do that was if it was yielding useful information, information with a strategic intelligence value. By 1983, it had done that because John Marsh, the Secretary of Army, was presented with a report in 1983 logging 700 remote viewing missions, 85% of which had been able to demonstrate the efficacy of remote viewing and 350 of which were deemed to have provided information of significant intelligence value. That's the only way it kept going, and it did. The funding was maintained through a number of presidential administrations. From 1972 to 1995, that's the presidential administrations of Richard Nixon, Gerald Ford, Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, George H.W. Bush, and Bill Clinton. The program continued only because it was providing verifiable information with an intelligence value to it. Since those in power wish to do the spying and not be spied upon, it isn't difficult to see why skills like remote viewing might not find their way into a science museum, textbook or school syllabus. For those reasons, the Christian prejudice against these kinds of phenomena as being either impossible or demonic becomes a useful button to press. Eventually, this kind of ingrained prejudice came back to bite the program. What brought the period of remote viewing within the CIA to an official close had nothing to do with its efficacy as a tool. It was theology. A new department leader was appointed in 1995 who had oversight of these operations, and he was a more fundamentalist kind of Christian. And in his faith worldview, anything that was supernatural, anything that could not be explained, had to be demonic. And he would have nothing to do with anything in the departments he was oversighting that hinted of anything demonic, thank you very much. And so purely because of his faith and his theological worldview, the program of remote viewing was shut down. Again, there's a very curious parallel as to what happened to remote viewing in British Secret Service four centuries before. The foundation for Britain's intelligence agency MI5 and its counterintelligence agency MI6 were laid by the work of Queen Elizabeth I in partnership with Sir Francis Walsingham and her chief scientific advisor, John Dee. Elizabeth Tudor first engaged the services of John Dee when she was a princess and heir apparent under house arrest during the reign of her elder sister, Queen Mary. Elizabeth was a Protestant, the daughter of the devoutly Protestant Queen Anne Boleyn, King Henry's beloved second wife. 
Princess Elizabeth strongly believed in what her father, King Henry VIII, had done in liberating British Christianity from the internationalized feudalism of Roman Catholicism. Elizabeth believed in a truly independent England, and in England's sovereign being truly sovereign. By contrast, Queen Mary was the Roman Catholic daughter of Henry VIII's first wife, the devout Roman Catholic Queen Catherine of Aragon. Following the Protestant reforms of the Church of England under the rule of her father, Queen Mary set about re-Catholicizing England, ridding the country as best she could of those she regarded as traitors to the Holy Church. Her younger sister Elizabeth was spared the Queen's axe, partly out of sisterly love and loyalty, and partly for fear of the invisible undercurrent of support for the reforms that Elizabeth represented. Accordingly, Queen Mary steered a careful middle course and had her sister held under house arrest outside of London at Hatfield House in Hertfordshire. In 1555, Queen Mary suffered an ectopic pregnancy, and so all of a sudden, the Queen's health and the succession were in question. Now, Princess Elizabeth was watching all this happen. She could see that the throne was going to come her way, but these were very uncertain times, and in order to accede to the throne, she first had to survive her sister's reign. Now, her half-sister, Queen Mary, was a devout Roman Catholic, and she was busy re-Catholicizing Britain and doing her best to rid Britain of every element within it that was reforming. In her mind, there was no distinction between a reformer and a revolutionary. She wanted to reposition England within the Catholic Empire of Europe. And she set about doing this by marrying the King of Spain. This was a marriage on paper only, and it resulted in no son and heir for the English throne. Princess Elizabeth was under house arrest, mainly in Hatfield House, although she was for a while on England's death row in the Tower of London. She wanted to survive, she wanted to inherit the throne, and she wanted to push the reforms forward. She wanted a church that believed that every human being can have a personal divine connection. And she wanted that same privilege for the monarch as well. A monarch of England should be sovereign, was her view, not subject to priests and bishops in other countries. And so she was going to push the reforms ahead if she could accede to the throne. With all the uncertainty around that, she called on the services of a Welshman by the name of John Dee. Now, John Dee was a top academic of the day, a shining intellect. Francis Bacon absolutely idolized him. René Descartes regarded him as the absolute Renaissance man. He was a scholar of mathematics, languages, and philosophy at the University of Cambridge. Elizabeth engaged him because she wanted him to do a reading for her. She wanted to see the astrological charts for the Tudor family. Now, anyone caught doing astrological readings at that time in the 1500s was risking arrest, trial, and execution for witchcraft. And John Dee was in no less danger. In fact, forces loyal to Queen Mary did discover what he had done. And because he'd done that reading for Princess Elizabeth, not only was it witchcraft, it was treason. He was imprisoned, on England's death row in the Tower of London and was tortured and forced to recant and return to the hearth of Roman Catholicism. Elizabeth knew the Tower of London from the inside and upon her accession to the throne was eager to reward John Dee's skill and prior loyalty, employing him within the royal court as the Queen's chief scientific advisor and personal counsel. This was a bit of a mouthful, really, so Queen Elizabeth preferred him to use his handle, which was 007. And that's no coincidence, because John Dee's work was right in the foundations of what was to become British intelligence, MI5 for intelligence, 
and MI6 for counterintelligence. Ian Fleming absolutely knew these stories and sewed a whole number of parallels and clues into the canon of James Bond. And of course, for James Bond, read John Dee. It is an indication of John Dee's influence over Queen Elizabeth that it was he who selected the date for her coronation, January the 15th, 1558. It was John Dee who first coined the phrase, the British Empire. And so he was offering to Elizabeth things she needed and wanted in that period. And she would have taken his thoughts extremely seriously. If you can think of the relationship between the mythical King Arthur and Merlin, well, now you're picturing the kind of relationship Queen Elizabeth had with John Dee. What Queen Elizabeth wanted John Dee to do for her was to develop a remote viewing program. That was to be the foundation of Her Majesty's Secret Service. Now, there are a couple of reasons why Queen Elizabeth may have believed this was possible. Firstly, she was a scholar of the Bible and she would have known a passage in 1 Kings 22 in the Hebrew scriptures when the prophet Micaiah remote views the Sky Council. That's the council of ET entities governing over Project Earth and Project Humanity. Then in the New Testament, in the Gospels, we see Jesus remote viewing one of the apostles, the apostle Nathaniel. Jesus says to him, I saw you under the fig tree. And the reaction that gets from Nathaniel makes it very clear there is no natural way Jesus could have possibly known what he was doing or saying under the fig tree. Jesus wasn't there and Nathaniel knew he wasn't there. And so this again is another case of remote viewing. There were other reasons the Queen may have believed it was possible. And one of those is that in the decades before, the libraries of the kings of Portugal and Spain would have been gifted with copies of texts from Central and South America. Now, when the Catholic forces of Portugal and Spain took Central and South America, the agenda was to take it for the kings of Portugal and Spain and the church, and to delete and replace the old narratives that had guided the civilizations of that part of the world in all the centuries before. That meant burning the old texts. That meant executing the priesthoods that curated those stories. Now, we know what some of those stories were because they resurfaced about 200 years later, thanks to the work of Dominican friar Francisco Jimenez, who produced what we now call the People's Book, the Popol Vuh, the indigenous story of beginnings. And those indigenous stories were stories of paleo contact, of ET visitors having a hands-on role in our development as a species, and they speak of a time when our ancestors had higher cognitive abilities than we do now, where they could do things like remote view and remote communicate. And those cultures had also curated mystical and shamanic modalities for re-engaging those higher abilities. If copies of those texts had made their way to Portugal and Spain, then in an era where there was a lot of movement of scholars, and a lot of movement of spies, it is very possible that that kind of information had reached the libraries of John Dee and his friends. Now, the country was flat broke. It simply could not afford to put boots in the field or spies in the court of every ally and enemy uh, where Queen Elizabeth wanted to know what are they thinking, what are they planning. Remote viewing was the obvious way of doing it to her mind. And so she tasked John Dee to develop the protocols and to develop the department, and in particular, to get hold of a copy of the Stegnographia by a German Benedictine monk by the name of Johannes Trithemius. The Stegnographia concerned the art of concealing hidden messages within written texts, a discipline with an immediate application in the world of espionage. The book also proposed methods for remote communication and remote viewing. It was John Dee's task 
to take that theory and make it work. Now to do this, John Dee needed a practitioner. And so he hired a man by the name of Edward Kelly. Edward Kelly was what today we would call a sensitive or a psychic. And they worked together for seven years, developing protocols of remote communication and remote viewing and yielding thousands of pages of information they had been able to glean through those methods. What were the methods? In his book, John Dee and the Empire of Angels, Jason Liu explores the worldview that undergirded the work of Edward Kelly and John Dee. It was a world in which everything was regarded as deeply connected in precise mathematical relationships. To peer into the workings of the natural world was to peer into the mind of God. The exploration of these paranormal phenomena was not regarded as separate to the work of science. It was all a part of understanding the nature of reality. To the modern ear though, the modality which they explored in order to achieve remote communication and remote viewing may seem a strange one. What they were aiming at was contact with entities they described as angels. That was the source of their channeled information. Now, in my books, Escaping from Eden and the Scars of Eden, I argue that to best understand our ancient texts, including the Bible, it serves us to go to the root meanings of the key words involved. There are many stories from the Bible, for instance, that we tell as God stories, but that in their original form are Elohim stories. The word Elohim means the powerful ones. And I argue that the powerful ones of the Bible are the sky people of the Sumerian stories, the root narratives, and that the sky people are what today you and I would call extraterrestrials. The word angels, similarly, that word doesn't indicate a kind of being. The word indicates a role or a function. The word angels doesn't indicate a particular genus or biology. It simply says that we're dealing with an entity that is not human, that has more advanced abilities in terms of travel, and is here on a mission, on an assignment, or with a message. Again, I would argue that most of our angel stories are in fact stories of paleocontact, our ancestors' memories of contact with extraterrestrials. So when John Dee and Edward Kelly presented their thousands of pages of channeled information, I believe that shows us that John Dee and Edward Kelly were contactees, and that for seven years, they had been experiencing what we would call close encounters. The way John Dee's Department of Remote Viewing was closed down bears a strange parallel to what happened with the US program. Because towards the end of Queen Elizabeth's reign, she faced the same kind of insecurity, uncertainty about the succession, which had afflicted her sister. And King James IV of Scotland was eyeing the English throne with a view to becoming King James I of England. And he was a more fundamentalist kind of Christian, not one who wanted anything to do with anything supernatural or inexplicable because in his mind that probably meant it was demonic. And so the dynamics were changing, the funding was discontinued, and John Dee's department was closed down. And it was a sad end for John Dee after being this shining light of the academic world of the intellectual world of the 16th century, and such an important figure within the courts of Queen Elizabeth I, he very sadly died in poverty. But once again, it's a story of the program being closed down, not because it wasn't working, but for theological reasons. Ancestral narratives around the world report ancient experiences of contact with beings from the stars. These narratives are inextricably linked 
with an explanation of human origins at odds with the mainstream view in the 21st century. When you go to our ancestral narratives, stories of human origins, paleo contact, and human potential are absolutely wrapped up in one another. According to our ancestors, we were in contact in the deep past. Our development was sometimes assisted and sometimes hindered by our ET contact. But there was most certainly a period when our ancestors were more engaged in precognition, remote viewing, telepathy, self-healing. And some of the information about remote viewing that was in the air at the time of John Dee and Elizabeth was there because of those ancestral texts. Other because of the work of scholars like Johannes Trithemius. But I think whether you're looking at individual case studies, your experience, my experience, the experience of our ancestors, is worth noting that separation of information because the powers have engaged with remote viewing for more than five centuries. It was there in the 1990s, 1980s, 1970s. It was there in the 1500s. And it was there in the pages of the Hebrew stories from millennia ago. I think that gives us every reason to consider the possibility that what the shamanic and mystical traditions of the world have to offer might be valuable in terms of heightening your ability and my ability to do this thing we call remote viewing. When you look at case studies of things that have been remote viewed at a distance of hundreds of miles, thousands of miles, or in the case of Ingo Swan, half a billion miles, you realize we're not just looking at a question of improving the performance of our brains. This goes to the heart of understanding the nature of our reality, because by the time you're remote viewing the rings of Jupiter, you are doing something that puts a huge question mark over everything we know about time and space and human consciousness. Thank you for watching The Fifth Kind TV. Remember to subscribe and click on the bell for notifications so that you never miss when we upload new content. For uncensored access to our full interviews and documentaries, go to fifthkind.tv. For more videos about paleo contact and the wisdom of the world's ancestral narratives, go to the Paul Wallace channel, subscribe, and click on the bell. You can join the Paul Wallace channel for a regular live stream and live conversation. Thank you for watching The Fifth Kind TV.